Welcome to Nantucket Island. This beautiful little island is just off the coast of Cape Cod in Maine. If you ever get a chance, visit this island. In the off season though, like we did. There's a lot of talk these days about electric cars and the role that they can play in climate change. And as you can imagine, gems like this island are often the most threatened. So we thought, what a better place to go ahead and test an electric car. What we have here is a 2015 BMW i3 fully electric that we rented for a day. So let's dive into some features. In typical BMW fashion, the i3's interior is a combination of both utility and luxury. If you're looking for a plush, supple interior like a Lincoln or a Cadillac, maybe even a Buick, BMW has never really been the brand for you. And this rings true for this model as well. Uh, that being said, it does somehow find a way to harmonize both elegance and a futuristic look. I mean, call me old fashioned, but I actually like a car that looks like a car and not something that I'd find coming out of a movie like Demolition Man or something like that. I, I don't know what it is, but when you look at the inside of a Tesla and I just see a screen and that's it, uh, it it's not just not for me. And I, I, can't, I can't imagine I'm alone in that. So the BMW is a hatchback that allows for easy loading, and while the overall size is small, it's adequate at about 15 cubic feet. That puts it just under half the size of a Subaru Outback for comparison, and of course a bit less than the Tesla Model 3. And I should also mention too, if you do fold down those rear seats, it'll give you about 36 cubic feet total, so it more than doubles the space. And you're thinking to yourself, well, this has a frunk, right? Well, let's go ahead and open it up. And taking a look, um, it's underwhelming. It's pretty small. I mean, it's probably about 20 by 9. You can see they have a uh, sealant kit, I think, in case your tires go low. You can uh, air them back up. It actually doesn't come with a spare tire. So that is your spare tire, which I honestly hate. Um, and, of course, no engine there, so that's why you have that frunk. That being said, I mean, it's a sharp car. Um, it's a cute car. It's a small car. Um, and it's better looking than some of its counterparts. The doors are uh, suicide doors in that they both open back out, as you can see here. Uh, so there's no center pillar in there. Um, it does allow for easier access to the back. And I did sit back here a few times. I mean, it's not uncomfortable. I wouldn't want to sit back there for long trips, but overall you can see it actually gives you a decent amount of space. Uh, it has a leather interior. Um, there's no engine in the bottom, so it's just holding batteries and whatnot. It has a sunroof up top. And as Pepper demonstrates here, it's pretty easy to get in and out. Um, shake your boots, get the sand off, and uh, overall, it's not a hard vehicle to get in, out, in and out of. It also is a little higher off the ground than you might expect. So you don't feel like you're stepping down into a really small car that's right on the ground. The layout is basically the same as a normal car. You turn the car on using the gear selector on the steering column. Uh, cruise control, wipers, lights are where you'd expect them. In the center here, this is how you control your display up here. Um, which, it's not touch screen, but it works pretty well actually. And once you get used to it, it uh, I kind of like it actually. And it's funny because with my touch screens and my current cars, which are obviously newer, um, sometimes I find myself fighting the touchscreen more often than not, so it's actually a little joystick in some ways gives you better control. That being said, I mean, today uh, I'd expect to see touchscreens, but this is about seven years old, so for the time it's pretty good. It has uh, climate control, as you can see, uh, heated seats, and a slew of other luxuries which you expect to see inside of a BMW. Uh, navigation's built into it. The heads-up display here is pretty easy to read. Um, keep in mind, I have my GoPro on top of my head, so uh, when you're looking down, you're looking straight at that display, and it's really visible. So, Another great thing, I don't know if you're noticing about this as I'm looking through here, is the visibility in this vehicle is fantastic. The windows are large, and you really have almost no blind spots from what I can see. So as we took this out for its paces throughout the day, it was a real pleasure to drive. It has pretty good acceleration. Well, I should say really good acceleration. And uh, it handles extremely well. Um, turning is tight, it's not loose. And the eeriest thing though is how quiet this vehicle is as you drive it. Which, let me go ahead and stop talking here and I'll let you actually hear the audio of what it's like driving. Oh, God. 
So as you can see, it's pretty darn quiet. Um, and so quiet that you can hear me breathing and Pepper losing her mind with her conversations about missing sidewalks. Oh, and that interesting hum that you hear, that's actually a speaker noise is coming out to warn pedestrians that we are driving by. Which with me on the road, probably is not a bad thing. So how does this thing drive and handle? Surprisingly well, it does really good on the city. And as you can see here, we found some of the worst roads we could probably ever find. Uh, Nantucket has regular roads and it has sand and mud roads. And we somehow ended up on this sand and mud road up in the far end of the island and took it through roads, probably only something with a dedicated four wheel drive like a Jeep or a Land Rover should have gone down. And this took it like a champ. Um, we didn't get stuck at all once. Um, so what are my thoughts driving it? I, I think it's a fun to drive vehicle. It, it's obviously really well thought out, really well engineered. Uh, there are some issues with it, of course, too, right? For example, that 80 to 100 miles is going to hurt you. So this would be good for taking back and forth to work, taking back and forth to the grocery store, um, and more day-to-day -day in and out utilitarian use. I wouldn't use this obviously for a long distance drive, but that makes sense though, because everyday driving is driving back and forth to the store, it is dropping kids off at soccer practice. It is driving back and forth to work. Uh, everyday driving isn't going on long epic trips. And for that, even a short range car like this of 80 to 100 miles is probably gonna meet your needs. And especially as infrastructure grows, where you have more plug-in uh, stops and more parking lots for the different places you go. And for that, I think this is a pretty good vehicle. See, it's interesting with these electric cars, we're in this transition state. Um, and yes, there are vehicles out there where you can get much longer range, but even those still have that cap. And the larger battery you put in these vehicles, the at this point in time, the longer it takes to recharge those. So we are in this transition period where we're using electric cars for our day-to-day -day use, which is 90% of our vehicle driving. And for those long trips, we still have our gasoline engines as well too. Um, I think there's this debate where it's gotta be one or the other. And I don't think that's how it should be. Um, I think each has its purpose. And I, if you think about it, if you really wanna be environmentally conscious um, or if you know you're on the other side where you don't put a lot of stock into that if you just want to save money or save resources which I think we can all agree that using you know less gas overall is a good thing it's using gas more gas is not a good thing um, it really serves that purpose right and I think that's where that big divide is and where these electric cars do become controversial is because you'll get a significant vocal group um, that says, look, it's electric or nothing, that you cannot have a gasoline vehicle going forward. And I don't see that as the case. I mean, even if you got rid of electric vehicles, you're still going to have uh, carbon-based fuel air vehicles. Now, you realistically, you can't make a jet right now without some type of fossil fuel burn. And uh, there's a lot of uh, uses for both. And it's really what that application is. And for that, these electric vehicles, you know, they're going to handle the bulk of what we're doing. Now, that being said, obviously, you need to do something about the batteries, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, lithium batteries, lithium itself is a more precious and valuable resource than the oil that it's replacing. And you can only recharge it and reuse it so much. Uh, so that being said, there are a lot of advances in technology. Uh, they're looking at more solid state batteries um, uh, made out of metal that are, you know, higher capacity that are almost drop in and drop out. I see a lot of great videos from people like Joe Scott talking about these future technologies. And I think that for what these are, these are a good thing. 
And the reason I say that is because I spent a long time in the automotive industry. And the EV1 came out in the early 2000s and it got shut down. In case you're unaware, that was the first electric car that was really put into production in recent years. That being said, electric cars have been around for over two centuries now. Um, the first one was in the 19 or 1830s, so I guess almost two centuries. But um, the first really push of an electric car was actually by General Motors about two decades ago. Um, but that got shut down for a number of reasons, not the least of which was the oil industry um, basically paying GM to shutter that program. So there's obviously a lot of interest going back and forth um, for and against fossil fuel use, but overall, I, I think it's good in some ways that we're seeing more of a push of electric cars. But uh, overall, I think the uh, future is pretty optimistic. And I think this is a pretty good example of a possible car that could kind of get you there. Now you might be asking yourself, why did we not drive a Tesla? Well, number one, they didn't have a Tesla on Nantucket, so that was out. And looking back, I'm kind of glad we took this out. And the reason is, is because I think, you know, you're either a fan of Tesla or you're not a fan of Tesla. I feel it's a very polarizing company. And let's be honest, are people right now that are buying Teslas buying it because it's an electric car or the best electric car out there right now? Or are they buying it because it's the cool car? Because there is a difference. And... If that person buys the brand because they feel it's cool and then or it's the new hip thing to do, what happens with that buyer when the company is no longer cool? There is just a risk in putting all of your hopes on electric vehicles into one basket with one brand. I mean, heck, we have examples of this in recent history. Just look at the Hummer. Uh, Hummers were an amazingly well-selling vehicle. Then suddenly, as soon as gas prices jumped up and people turned against that product it became a for the most part a dead product you're seeing a resurgence now but you know that's a select small part of the market and if you're eventually going to get the bulk of people using electric cars you can't have them all going into a brand that's polarizing so i think these alternatives we see coming out like bmw producing these um, over the years now and you see more adoption now from Ford and Chevy and everyone else is a good thing so so that all being said what is your final verdict on this vehicle and would you buy it well there are a lot of pros uh, it's a cute car it's a fun to drive car it's utilitarian it's classy looking um, it handled really well and it got through a lot of nasty stuff then you have the negatives and not a lot of negatives it's a little small but i mean there are larger options i guess available but if this fits your size i think it would work and but the biggest con to me of this vehicle is its range of 80 to 100 miles and would i recommend that for most people probably not because most people don't have more than one car uh, if you can afford to have more than one car or if you can have more than one car in your household, maybe this would fit the bill as that vehicle you're gonna use for the majority of the time. But in the end, you're gonna need something that's gonna go outside your normal range, right? And because of that, I'm not 100% sure I'd recommend this for most people. Um, so if you're looking for an extra car, or let me rephrase that. If you're looking for a car to be your primary vehicle for day-to-day -day use, and you're still going to have an extra car lying around to use yeah you know what i think this is a possible way to go is this going to be is this going to fit the bill as your only means of transportation and unless you're going to be limit yourself to you know short ranges probably not and um so that being said it's a stepping stone right and uh, i think ultimately this is probably why bmw uh, decided to stop making this model. They're replacing it with the i4 uh, in, I think it's 2022 or 2023. Might be coming out now. And it solves a lot of these problems that the i3 had, which was the range. So that being said, I, I tell you, we had so much fun with this car driving it over the day. 
Um, there is still a part of me that does think about picking one of these up if we get it cheap enough, which unfortunately right now is not really a possibility. They're pretty high up there as far as cost goes still. But uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, you know, please click like and subscribe for future content. It really does help out the channel. Uh, we try to upload as often as we can while working busy full-time schedules. And uh, we hope to see you in those future videos. But until we do, get out there. Make your own great outdoor adventures. And as always, take care.